Um, thank you everybody for coming and one this year was really interesting. We had so many, so many amazing submissions and we're really excited. Uh, the judges deliberated till maybe 2 a.m. yesterday, so it was really, really tight this year. Um, one of the criteria that we're going to discuss in the panel, this session is a little different from last year. We're going to have a, a panel with the judges to discuss kind of the state of UX and design as well as, um, and we'll kind of touch upon all these points of the criteria. And our judges, I'm really excited to introduce. We have Benny from CryptoKitties and Dapper Labs. Ooh. Hello, hello. Woo. Yeah, you can sit down. And then we have Alex from Coinbase, joining us from Product Design. Hello. And then uh, Brainu, and, and we're actually really excited to bring back Arjun. Arjun was the winner, uh, one of the winners of last year. And so uh, they're coming back as a judge. And it's really great to see how far everyone has come. And Grammy, uh, the UX design director, is not here today. But we have Julian, who is one of the co-founders of Arjun. Cool. So we're going to start this panel um, just kind of talking about where are we in the state of UX? I know we've been talking a lot about UX and design, but coming from um, such product oriented, and you guys have quite a suite of products. You have Hopper, you have Coinbase Pro, you have you guys have a new blockchain now. So tell us, uh, Ben, you start with a little bit of um, where you think we are in the design space specifically in Web3. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, Coming from the game space, we have almost more than 50% of the, t the company is focusing on the game studio side. So designing UX and UI for games is much more different from DeFi. Uh, fortunately, we spend a lot of time with our top players of CryptoKitties and Cheese Wizards, our new game. And we get to learn a lot about uh, the different pain points that they have. And the pain points that gamers have, or blockchain gamers have, is very different from somebody who wants to make a compound loan uh, or use Coinbase. Uh, they have a, a higher expectation of the flow being extremely smooth. Uh, and so that's kind of like, at least from the game side, what we think about a lot. Um, yeah. And what are some of the things, and maybe you guys can kind of come in, the things that we're doing right and what things we're doing wrong, maybe Argent, you guys can start as well. That's, that's a great question. Um, I think we are starting to do a lot of things right. I think maybe to complement your, your first question, I think this is a very exciting period because the blockchain and Ethereum is still a, a young technology. And I think we are gradually uh, reaching outside of small crypto bubble. And I think a, a lot of that capability is done through improving uh, the user experience. I think especially from our gen, it comes from the technology. And I think we, we try to solve problem by the technology first, and, but, but I think this is really an exciting time because we, we get to show this amazing technology to the outside world while still uh, maintaining its core principle. And I think this is something that is, that is very important, is to, to being able to reach to, to people that may be less tech savvy, but still maintain our, our core principle about decentralization. Yeah, I mean, Ola, you're, you're kind of the design, uh, product design representative here, what are some of the design uh, opportunities that we've, we've had and what's going on in the space? I, I echo what you said. Uh, having sat through UX audits, I think uh, we came a really long way from, you know, early big uh, decentralized products that were very much focused on uh, exploring that technology to building more and more user-friendly, user-focused things. We are, as com like you guys, as companies, you start to focus more on uh, basically solving user needs, uh, finding the good copy, creating good mental models. I think we still have uh, some challenges to overcome we still sort of i see project designing for just the fun of technology but uh i think we're going in the good direction of putting the user first and having the user introduced like being able to introduce the user to the crypto yeah i mean so going going towards that in your company you guys have kind of one of the most well-adoption in, in kind of products with well-adopted adopted, um, 
features. So how do, what does design look like in your process? There's a lot of kind of, as we saw from the UX audits, a lot of teams that come in and we're like, we don't have a designer, we don't know what to do. So uh, how did that start from you guys and, and how does that grow currently in the current state? Yeah. Maybe give a head start here. I think for us, design starts by thinking about the user. So in everything we do, we first really focus on the user. And to give a, an example, when we started Argent, we were thinking about you know, how to manage your, your account or your keys. And we really try to think what's a user experience that people actually understand, people outside of our bubble. And, and we, we realize that the user of, of uh, the experience of banks, for example, we may not like banks, traditional banks, but the idea that if you lose your credit card, you lose your wallet, you can actually call your bank to get a new one, we kind of felt that this was a mental model that, that users uh, would understand. And so we tried to replicate that first using the technology, and that's why we build a smart contract based wallet, and then adding a, a, a layer of, of, of UX and design uh, on top of it. So for us, really, the, the, the starting point is the user, trying to solve the problem for a user. Then we use the technology, and then we use shiny button, good design, you know, flows and stuff like that. But I, I think the starting point is really to start from the user. When traditionally, I think in, a, in an ecosystem where people are very tech savvy, we tend to start from the technology. We build a cool technology, and then we think, okay, you know, how will the user use my technology? I think we should, the paradigm will need to be shifted. It should be, how oh, can I solve a problem for a user and then find the right technology to solve that? Yeah, you're kind of going touching upon the next question here about users and although we were having this really interesting conversation around how, how, are, how do you find your users and, and, and how do you define who your user group is? So, you know, as you know, Coinbase has a portfolio of different products, uh, and I, both custodial and non-custodial. And I think what we're doing really well is kind of understanding that not, of our, not an entire group of our users is the same. So we kind of funnel them into different, uh, into different places. And uh, with having that in mind, we actually do talk to our users very early as well. We, I mean, we just had this discussion of like, it is a lot of teams say that it is very difficult to find uh, a user group without breaking their privacy. And I, I claim the opposite. It's just you basically need to hassle a little bit and reach out to your community, reach out, use different platforms, uh, ask people to come to your office or just set up Hangouts and just talk to your user, understand what their pain points are, understand what they kind of expect. You will learn that maybe your initial assumptions are completely in a different place than what your users really think. And uh, I think in our case, it's one of the things that, that builds the biggest advantage in how we think about our product. Uh, Benny, I'm excited to hear your answer because I've talked to your design team and you guys have just started unraveling user research and reaching out with cheese wizards. What does that look like for you guys? So, cheese wizards stem from us being in the room and thinking about what is the next weirdest thing we could build, both from a technical standpoint of building a battle royale blockchain game and the sense of mixing cheese with wizards. Um, so we have that kind of luxury of uh, thinking creatively of, you know, what will tickle us uh, and how can we kind of emanate that as a, as a project. Um, then we kind of go through the step of building really fast prototypes uh, that are off-chain and we like to test it. We've done probably by now more than 10 play tests of Cheese Wizards internally and each iteration we kind of um, improve uh, the way it looks, the way the flow goes. Uh, recently, about three weeks ago, we had uh, the last final play test for Cheese Wizards on the Rinkby network. It was pretty much, uh, it had most of the features that we, are, we have uh, set to launch for next week. And, you know, what we did was, I built a, a battle cage inside of the office and uh, curated uh, duels between different people in the company. And not only that, we had the user, the user research team that was sitting there and kind of uh, asking questions and uh, getting uh, mapping out the user journey and their emotions through the entire process of going through the flow. Uh, and from that, we also we also sent a daily surveys to capture all the information uh, from the team members. 
we usually start with internal, then we invite a core group of maybe a small sample size of external players to come and play, and we do the same thing where we measure every day and see uh, where we can improve, and then that gets funneled to engineering and design. Uh, then now at, we're at this point where we've been, we had an open beta this entire week, uh, so we welcome the entire uh, space here at DevCon and, and our community to play the game. And uh, we have on the website like uh, any any bugs or issues, feel free to fill out the form, and that's how we usually capture a lot of the information and funnel it up to design and engineering, uh, and then build out those features inside of the game. Yeah, I want to pull from that like that user research component of it. Um, that I, that's been a big narrative this year at DevCon. Last year it was kind of like mass adoption, mass adoption, um, and and before that it was like how do we understand and get to know our users better. And so pulling from that, we were just talking about market research versus design research. And um, the team from Cello said it really well, which is with, des uh, with market research, you might get 100 people and get 10 insights. But with design research, you get 10 people and get 100 insights. So you're going super deep and taking that time to ask them um, how, like, not just questions about your product, but questions around what, how do you um, go about your, your flow, like your goal? How do you get a person to finish that goal? Maybe it's like going to the bank, okay, what happens if you lost your money? Where do you go? Um, and that doesn't have to be directly correlated to your product because you're not trying to tell them like this is the product that's going to solve your, your needs if you don't know what those needs are yet. So, so kind of back to that, let's go back to use, like usability and what I call the responsibility of the creator. And so you guys have one of the biggest products, you literally broke Ethereum, but, <laughs> um, but what do you guys find that for your users, what do you guys try to do to protect them or give them kind of this space? What's different um, in the way that you're creating product that you think about? Um, Ola, do you want to start? You want to start? Go ahead. <laughs> so is it in comparison to how other blockchain games build the built games and the way that they build the process or in comparison to DeFi or other wallets? Yeah, it's hard because you guys all have so many different products. <laughs> so um, I would say, I mean, I think generally a lot of people are thinking about how they build the product. Um, so when you're building the product, there's fundamental um, kind of decide decisions in that you create. Um, while you're creating the product, and that has to do with kind of the underlying user needs. Yeah. I think for me it's about, of course you make choice when you design a product and you make choice on behalf of the user, but I think something that's very important is to inform the user about these choices and making sure you're not hiding anything. So I think users have to make conscious choices and know maybe the compromise they are making. Some users are, are fine using a custodial service, some users may not be. So I think it's important that actually we, we educate, not educate, we inform the user about the choice that he's making and the trade-off that he may, he may get from the choice that he's making. I think this is something for us that's very important. Also at Arjun, we believe that there is a border not to cross. So there's some core, as I mentioned, some core principle that we don't want to compromise on. And then after that, all that goes on top of that is really a question of, of informing the users and, and helping him making a wise choice because it's easy to, to badly inform or to hide something and make decision. I think it's, it's actually the UX is really responsible of that. It's, it's letting the user be informed about the choices that he's making. Yeah, I want to pull that a pull from that, and I will get to you because it's there's some ideas around the abstraction of information to avoid complexity for the user, and so I know Coinbase has Pro. You guys have custodial, non-custodial. You guys have different kinds of users as well. Um, how does how's that structured for you guys, and, and what have you kind of seen? And I think the as long as coming from the crypto community, I would want to say that uh, let's do. I would want to believe that uh, we should make users think. Uh, it's not exactly how the product works. Uh, and uh, I think certain um, features are in the finan existing financial system there for a reason. So for example, account recovery is there because you know we tend to forget our passwords. We tend to do stuff that um, kind of work against us almost. So. Uh, you know, thinking about these things as like features, not necessarily the sort of old system, but rather how can we help users 
sort of enter the crypto community through, or crypto technology through maybe more evolution rather than revolution. So we can, uh, in wallet, for example, we have the, um, we allow users to back their crypto, uh, their security, uh, their secret keys through uh, their Google Docs. And there are, there are solutions that are more decentralized and solutions that are, that are more centralized. The most important element for us is like knowing who our audience are and like making sure that we're going to protect them uh, and at the same time give them the opportunity to do like to choose where, which direction they want to go to. I really like that idea of the evolution <laughs> before a revolution. Um, I think we last year kind of I, we already see that evolution in terms of last year it was like let's put out all the really big. Um, problems and the questions and we want to solve for really, really big important things um, around banks and the system and centralization. But the adoption that we see there and where that bridge, we're, we're almost there, but we're trying to design for a user that's users that are not quite there yet. They're not that quite knowledgeable. I think that's a difficulty of the moment we are in is that there's some kind of tension because you want to build for the next wave of, yeah. of users coming but we still want to be relevant today. And so what people understand today is not what people will understand in, exactly. in, in the future. And to give you a, a good example about that, I have a good friend that I managed to convince to use Argent and he was really excited to put his money into Compound. And so he downloads Argent and he used actually, because we didn't have a fiat to, to crypto on RAM at that point, he used Coinbase to buy some DAI. Then he wants to send his DAI to Argent. And then he's, He's calling me and he's like, dude, I cannot send my, my DAI to Arjun. And I said, yes, look at that screen. It says you can send ERC20. He's like, what's an ERC20? So actually on Coinbase, he converted his DAI to Ether, so he could send Ether. And then on Arjun, converted the Ether back to DAI. By the time he had done that, he had lost like 6 or 7%. And he was like, your product makes no sense. And I think we're saying about understanding our users, I think there's also a lot of uh, feedback. And we need to be able to listen to feedback. So for example, for us, customer support is very important because we do user research, we meet our users, but actually listening to the feedback of the yeah. users is, is all you learn the most. Because we make a lot of assumptions of what people understand and what people know. That example for us was like, of course, nobody knows what's an ERC20. So you know, we need to make that explicit. I think it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a silly example, but I think it shows that, as you, to answer your first question, we are getting there, but we are clearly not there yet for the next wave. What about for what you guys are working on? And you guys have launched Dapper as well um, and, and creating the seamless experience for the types of users you have, which are gamers, and they're, they're expecting a certain type of flow. When we launched CryptoKitties at ETH Waterloo, um, we basically had, uh, we, we did a lot of onboarding uh, for MetaMask. Uh, people came up to us and was like, what is this? Can I download this? Uh, what is gas? Uh, and we sat down with tons of people helping them set it all up. And as CryptoKitties grew really big, we, I think at one point, um, drove nearly 200,000 uh, downloads to MetaMask. And uh, a lot of these people would come to Discord. Uh, and uh, we, our Discord basically became MetaMask support uh, for a lot of these uh, players who wanted to uh, buy some kitties and breed some kitties. And you could imagine the hundreds of thousands of questions that we have received uh, from doing MetaMask support in our Discord. And that helped us kind of understand uh, in a very full picture of all the issues um, that has arrived with private keys uh, and with like uh, the con manual controls of gas and looking at uh, the gas station and making the right uh, selection. And so Dapper Wallet, we've been working on it for about nearly nine months now. It's a smart contract wallet, um, and it's built from the ground up in terms of rethinking how key recovery works. Um, and actually the Dapper team, the Dapper Wallet team is embedded in the NBA team now. Uh, the NBA team, as you know, we're building a, a basketball game uh, for 2020. Uh, and um, we have access to, you know, we have access to a lot of the fans and getting a deeper understanding of are these fans of NBA uh, even thinking about digital collectibles or true item ownership. And as with anything that we do, we always start off with the users as Julian said. Uh, and we have thousands of conversations on a monthly basis. And that really helps us as a company get 
build this obsession of like, hey, this is not very good. Maybe we should change this, right? A prime example was um, we call smart contract wallets now or smart wallets. It's a, it's a simpler term. Back, I don't know, six months ago, everyone's saying multi-signature or multi-sig. And when we did user research, people were just like, what is multi-sig? Like, <laughs> what, what, what is a multi-sig wallet and what is a MetaMask? And uh, we even drilled down to each individual word uh, that we use when we invite people into our offices. And um, we just get really blank faces all the time of like, oh, okay, they don't really understand this word. Uh, and that really helps us like kind of sit in their shoes and design something uh, from their perspective. And so with Dapper, one of the things that we uh, built was the subsidizing gaps for the users. So for if you play CryptoKitties or any of the Dapper Labs games or the Dapper Labs partners, partners um, the people, the, your players don't have to worry about paying gas. Uh, we've uh, completely eliminated that, and we actually even changed the word gas to network fee because through research, people just like get very confused about like why am I putting gas in my wallet? Uh, it makes no sense. So yeah, that's kind of all the reference points that we have as a company, and so how we start the process of designing something uh, that people could actually use. Yeah, I want to pick it back on that a little bit. The one thing that I want to say is that design is not about design. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Building product is sort of like this this whole whole that contains of like three parts: business, technology, and design. And when you take away one of it, your product will not be. Uh, you're basically going in the wrong direction. You're probably there is a higher chance that you're going in the wrong direction. And so what I really like about what we do at CoinRace is that the these three uh, functions uh, gathered together very early on in the before every feature, every product that we start, and we actually go through the market fit, the technology, and uh, what do our users want, sort of trying to balance the new products, uh, having that in mind. And uh, again, design is not necessarily about you know pixels that you do. It's, uh, it's the user experience that your users uh, will I want to say experience, but yeah, but uh, we'll go through when interacting with your product. Um, and I think we'll see a lot of that, but I think going through the judging as well, it's like there's so many amazing, beautiful products, um, and, and the judges are really good about what is actually useful, what is the problem, is there a problem that the, the product is solving, and if so, are they clearly figuring out the depths of that problem? I think, Arjun, for you guys, you guys started with that problem, right? Um, yeah. And, and do you want to touch upon that? Can you say that again? Uh, did you want to? Do you want to say something? Can you repeat oh, okay. that <laughs> sentence. <laughs> um, with, with kind of the starting with a problem mm -hmm. part of it, um, you guys kind of formulate that. You touched upon it earlier, earlier um, yeah. in the talk. So for you guys, how are you? Uh, does that problem also evolve as people are getting more knowledgeable about the space, or do you see that as kind of the core problem? I, I think, it, yeah. You, what we think is that you need to build a product for users, and it needs to solve uh, a problem for the users. So I think also in, yeah, in this space, we are often excited about the technology, but we, I think a lot of people outside of Bubble will not care too much about decentralization. They will not care about these, these principles. So we need to be able to find a problem that we solve for users. I think people will come to the blockchain if it solves a problem that cannot be solved by the current technology. And I think it needs to solve it by a 10x factor at least for people to actually actually make that switch. So clearly for the moment, being a wallet, you are solving a problem for the current ecosystem because most people uh, don't know that. But, but what we believe is that the blockchain will solve people, uh, will solve problem for, for all people. Of course, I think that's the common vision that we are we are all sharing here. So we are really trying to kind of anticipate this problem. And for us, it's about laying the, the foundation. I think if you make that analogy between the blockchain and the internet, for example, at the early days of the internet, people had to write common lines and you had to understand TCP IP. And, and then suddenly people came up with the idea of a browser and then you have a nice interface and you click on button and then it becomes much more uh, usable by, by all people. And, and I think for the internet, the user is not, uh, the, the, the browser is not what made the internet go wrong. I think it came afterwards. It came by the fact that there was no native payment in the browser and so people had to go to to marketing and, and, and ads, and that's what kind of corrupted 
the internet. But so I think it's it also shows that by making the right technological choices now, we are preventing I think our technology to go in the wrong direction in the future. I think with the internet they made some mistake, and personally I think it become, it's because of payment, the lack of native payment in in the, the internet stack, and I think it is kind of a responsibility now to make sure that we build a technology that doesn't reproduce these same mistakes. Oh, wow. So with that, we're just wrapping up this panel. Thank you guys for sharing your insights. Um, and now we're going to move on to the ceremony where we're going to be awarding the winners. Um, so first, this year we've got the most adorable uh, Crypto Caillou Crypto Kitties. And they're physical trophies this time. Um, and they're actually um, with it NFT. And they have special powers, which is UX <laughs> embedded in their genes. So thank you for Crypto Caillou for participating and working with us on this. We're excited. You guys will see the trophies in a few. And with that, um, Benny is going to. Sorry, with Julian, he's going to introduce yeah. the first, uh, Thank you. first winner. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to announce that uh, the first winner is Ramp Instant. I think Ramp is a, is a company that solves a very complicated problem, which is going from fiat to crypto. And unfortunately, I wasn't part of the discussion, but I received their feedback. But, but as, their, you know, as knowing their product, I think what they do extremely wide, what, right, and it's a value that we share, is that they abstract the complexity of a very difficult problem without compromising on some core principle. So they managed to maintain decentralization into the way they tackle fiat uh, to crypto, which is which is quite quite impressive. Okay, with so, that, yeah. what do I do? I'll introduce. Hi, thanks. Really excited to be here. So at Ramp, we try to solve crypto onboarding, and, um, or at least a very important part of it. Um, crypto onboarding consists of, first, we think that it has two very uh, important parts. First is getting your crypto, and second, managing your keys. Uh, there are many companies that uh, manage your keys very well, and we are pretty close to getting this problem solved. Um, but crypto onboarding with like actually purchasing crypto is still complicated. So first, it's complex. Think about going to a DAB that you love and just want to use, um, but actually having to go to a entire, an entirely different interface in order to purchase your crypto. Um, think about the churn with users if you are a DAB that is actually targeting a mass user and trying to get uh, crypto to mass adoption, and then getting to send them uh, or um, relating them to some third-party website uh, in order to purchase your crypto. And then imagine how, ma how many of your users, like normal typical users who are used to uh, one-click everything, would churn and just turn away. Second, it's intimidating. So why do you need my passport? Why do you need my ID? Why do you need my um, car license, uh, car driving license? Um, we also think that uh, this turns away a lot of users who just want to casually try um, crypto for the first time, and it also creates a lot of churn. Three, it's time-consuming, that's self-explanatory. Four, it is scary. We uh, hear about crypto um, uh, exchanges collapsing all the time, and this is a problem that you can really solve with uh, smart, uh, smart contract infrastructure. So what we thought is to build an, a crypto on-ramp, built on smart contracts, entirely peer-to-peer -peer and custodianless. Um, but really, if you build some cool tech, you need to think about the end users. You need um, to base your uh, development or on emp empathy. It's not enough to build a uh, cool tech. You need to wrap it with an enjoyable user interface to create this delightful experience. So first, Ramp Instant is a widget that you can implement into your DApp today. Um, or uh, if, you, if you build a wallet, we, are also, we, are also, we also think that this is a great way to onboard your new users uh, into crypto. Um, so it, Ramp Instant becomes part of the flow of your DApp. Second, with, it connects with your bank, and this solves uh, KYC issues. Uh, most of our users can do uh, their purchases without scanning their license or uh, passport. Three, we let users uh, keep control. So we do, do not ask them for their credit card. We do it via banking interface. And every uh, transaction needs to be confirmed by the user inside the banking interface. You will see that in a moment. And um, first and foremost, it is uh, based on smart contracts. 
um, and uh, maintains an escrow for each and every transaction that you initiate. So you do not need to uh, fear about your uh, transaction go coming through, and it is not as scary as using a centralized exchange. So um, when it comes to design process, we thought that it is very important to actually talk with users and um, uh, to do uh, an iterative process when you prototype, user test, and repeat. Prototype, user test, and repeat. And by the way, there is a cool tip uh, if you want uh, to supercharge this process. Talk with DeepWork Studio. They structured our uh, designing process. Charlie is there. Big round of applause to Charlie. Um, and yeah, so today you can enjoy your Rampy Instant on your phone and on your desktop. Uh, it is a standalone uh, crypto onboarding app, but you can also implement it into your DAP or wallet. Uh, it's sweet, it's very simple to use. I hope we can, we can get this video to work. Yeah, it works. Um, so in this flow, you connect to your bank account and you create an instant payment. This instant payment gets initiated inside uh, the actual banking app. You authorize it inside the app banking app and just after minutes, uh, the payment is confirmed and you can expect your crypto uh, to uh, reach your uh, user uh, within uh, three minutes or less. So that's Ramp Instant. Um, you can actually use it today. Um, go to ramp.network, that's ramp.network, or scan this QR code, and uh, we can get you uh, ready to uh, implement it in just minutes. It's 17 lines of code, very simple SDK. Um, we handle all of it, liquidity, regulatory, uh, and parts of the interface, because we provide a widget that is co-branded with your brand. Thank you. We're excited for Oled to introduce Three Box. Three Box. For the for the last uh, three days, we heard a lot this comparison of Ethereum projects to uh, Lego blocks and Three Box comments component. Uh, comments component is exactly that. It's tiny, inconspicuous block that has a little bit of technology, UX and UI. It's probably cannot vary the weight of your construction by itself, but we think that in the, you will find this component in a lot of projects in the future. Welcome and congrats. Cool. Thank you. Sorry. All right, great. The video's just gonna run. Hi, I'm Michael from 3Box. Uh, at 3Box, it's our mission to make it really easy to build better apps. Um, personally, like we've been around the space for a while, and just got tired of seeing dApps be uh, limited to buy-sell transfer and limited only to on-chain interactions. And so we saw that there was a huge opportunity for making more interactive applications with real-time data um, that lives off-chain on IPFS and in distributed networks. And so at 3Box, we, we built a system that enables devs to make better use of these P2P technologies to manage the data for their application. Um, and what you see here is a comments component. Like um, Ola said, it's, the goal here was to make it as easy as possible to add a discuss-like functionality to your application. And you can drop this anywhere, um, like basically on any website that has Web3. And some of the cool things that we did with it were um, trying to think of how we can handle authentication and how do you pass the Web3 provider to the component. And so there are three options here, which I think um, we're probably running through in the video, but um, yeah, you can log in directly to the component, so the application itself on a global state doesn't need to handle the provider. Um, the component can accept the provider from the global application state, um, and you can do that in two ways. Like one, when the user, when the user first onboards to your site, um, you can authenticate them to 3Box, and what that does is it actually opens up a, a local IPFS and OrbitDB node right in the browser. Um, and syncs out and collects data from the rest of the network. So um, it's local first, um, it can run offline, and just makes it super simple to get started. Like there's no extensions that users have to download or plug in, um, it just runs. And so you can see that there's also profiles on here. So um, outside of the comments component, 3Box offers 3Box.js SDK, which makes it really easy to, um, it provides a developer interface to add profiles distributed storage and messaging to your application. And so this uses specifically the profiles and the messaging APIs. Um, and so this actually wraps our three box 
SDK. Um, and also what's cool here are we use Ethereum keys for authentication and signing, um, but we have a, a did method, a decentralized identifier method under the hood. And so uh, in the future, we can extend this to all the different Ethereum keys that you have across all of your different wallets while maintaining the same profile and the same data. And then taking that a step further, you can also think about extending that to other chains and other shards and you know, even Web2 authentication methods as well. Um, so the goal is always to have data follow you around the web and not be trapped in any sort of centralized silo or service. Um, and 3Box actually lets you do that in a real way that's simple. And so I'm excited that you're excited about the comments component. We really hope that um, this is a useful tool. And um, we're making other plugins, so this isn't the only one. We have a profile hovers plugin, which if you hover over these profiles here, you'll see like a little modal that pops up kind of like Twitter that shows you additional profile metadata. Um, and in a week or two, we'll be releasing a chat box component plugin, and that really lets you add like a global site-wide chat, like a troll box to the corner of your site, all built on P2P tech using our profiles and APIs. Um, so super excited, thank you, um, and look forward to chatting with all of you. Yeah. <laughs> and next we have Benny introducing Zarian. All right. Who here has created a CDP? Raise your hands. Okay. Cool. DeFi is the future, but it's complicated because you have to create, go over here for a compound loan, you go over here for a CDP. Uh, so we're really excited to announce the final winner, which is Zerion. Uh, they've done a great job in making it extremely easy for you to create an account and go to all of these different DeFi services. Uh, so we're really excited for them to be the winner. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. Hello. Uh, it's, uh, it's really an honor to be here, and we are super excited uh, about uh, Zarian, to present Zarian to you. Uh, I'm Evgeny. Uh, and, um, what we believe in Zarin is actually that users should own and control their assets. And also we think that um, financial access should be universal. So given that in mind, we, we have designed Zarin to be first a non-custodial uh, bank for DeFi. And second, uh, it allows you to, um, you to access all different DeFi protocols in, in a single place. So I'm going to show you the, the demo of how Zarian looks just like a typical flow that people will see uh, while using Zarian. So first, you, you need to connect your, any of your wallet we support, all wallets, uh, like all mobile wallets and MetaMask and Ledger. Uh, then you can see all your assets on the account uh, as a, and, and the performance over time. We have integration with Freebox, so it shows your Freebox profile on the top. And, um, yeah, so then you'll be able to see all your Uniswap pool tokens as well. Uh, and uh, we even have a mobile app that allows you to uh, track your portfolio, like your DeFi portfolio on the go. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to show you how you can easily swap um, one Ether, let's say, or like to buy 100 DAI uh, through Zarin. And, you can, and that happens through Uniswap. And, uh, and it directly goes to the Uniswap contract. You confirm the transaction in, in the wallet that you have connected. Uh, and you can easily see how uh, it's see like right now it's pending in the history tab. Uh, we will show you all the history. In, in history, we show the transactions in a really user-friendly form. Uh, for instance, like that's uh, adding liquidity to Uniswap or all the trades and like all you receiving money from other people. Uh, so once uh, it's mined, you're going to get a push notification as well. Uh, and it's, uh, so this interface can act as a complete replacement of your, uh, like, let's say, my Ether wallet or other things like that. Then once you get some DAI, you can instantly go to Compound and purchase and put money into Compound to start earning interest right away. That's, uh, again, a super seamless uh, flow. Um, yeah, uh, so this is uh, mainly it about Zarian. Uh, come and try, check it out yourself. Uh, I hope you love it. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much again. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. 
And we wanted to give uh, one runner-up, Aragon. Uh, they did win last year as runner-up last year, but we, you got to check out this great video. say that all of the three winners and the runner-up had uh, one thing in common. They were very easy to use. The, the mental models were exactly how users sort of expect them to be. The copy, especially like in bigger projects, were so well, um, so detailed and so well thought out uh, that all three of them, like all three of them made a really great job in and made a really big, pro with Aragon example, they made a really big progress in where they were a year ago, so. Yeah, I think that's maybe what the judges uh, struggled with the most was there's so many that applied last year and the progress that they've made. And so Aragon, we definitely wanted to kind of showcase some of the new design system that they, they built. Um, so with that, thank you everybody. Thank you to Ethereum Foundation and thank you guys all for sitting here and coming. <laughs>